Okay, thank you for the introduction. My name is Hui Le. I'm from the University of Stuttgart, and I will present this work on behalf of my co-authors Sven Meyer and Niels Hensel. So smartphones offer a wide range of functions which we can access through a touchscreen. And on a technical basis, touchscreens generate touches into two-dimensional coordinates which are mapped to the user interface. And this concept enables an intuitive interaction but also limits the input vocabulary since users prefer to hold their devices in a single-handed grip. So when we hold a smartphone, as we can see in this image here, the input consists of a single coordinate by the thumb, but all other fingers on the back of the device are not used at all. And this slows down the interaction compared to input devices which are designed to be used with multiple fingers, such as a computer mouse or a keyboard. So previous work extended the input space to the back side of the device to enable all other fingers on the back side to interact. And this concept is called back of device interaction and basically attaches a second device or an external touchpad to the back side of a smartphone. And this works well for many exciting use cases, but inputs of different fingers are still treated equally. And more importantly, the full finger surface and the hand surface is touching the back side of the device during interaction. And this makes it challenging to infer meaningful 2D coordinates and to recognize any form of intended interactions. And to avoid this problem, previous work limited the size of the touch panel to the upper half of the device or assumed uncommon grips so that only the fingertip is touching the back side. But by doing so, back-of-device interaction is limited to a small area of the phone so that use cases like grip sensing would not be possible at all. And we address this challenge and present InfiniTouch, a smartphone prototype which enables touch input on the whole device surface. And in addition, our prototype uses deep learning to estimate the 3D position of the fingertips based on the raw capacitive measurements. And with this, each finger can now be responsible for a different function, while inputs of all other fingers and uh, other parts of the hand are automatically ignored. And this opens a wide range of new use cases, which I will show in the following. So one sample use case that we implemented are finger-specific gestures. So in this example, swiping down with both the index and the middle finger would select all files in our file manager application. And in contrast, swiping down with only the index finger would copy a selection to the clipboard, while the middle finger is responsible to pasting files from the clipboard. And the concept of finger-specific gestures could be applied to any other application. So for example, as shortcuts to frequently used functions, or an application in which we want to avoid occlusion of the touchscreen through fingers or UI components such as buttons. Another use case that we implemented uses the flexion state of the middle finger as an action modifier. So in this example, users can draw in a painting application when the middle finger on the back side is stretched. But when bending the middle finger, the eraser is activated without the need to select it on the user interface. And the concept of finger flexion works similar to how modifier keys on keyboard work and augment the uh, touch input on the front screen. And this concept introduces a wide range of new input dimensions and could be applied to other applications, such as for mode switching, 3D navigation, or to provide sh uh, shortcuts. So our smartphone prototype is based on two LG Nexus 5 devices for back and front touch, as well as an Arduino for capacitive touch sensing on the edges. And instead of simply attaching both Nexus 5 devices back to back, we separated the touch screens from all other remaining processing units to avoid a bulky device which would affect how users usually hold a smartphone. So on the right side, we can see the handheld device, which is what users will hold in their hand and what they use to interact with. And the handheld device is based on a 3D printed frame which holds two touchscreens, one on the back, one on the front, as well as the copper plates for capacitive touch sensing on the sides. And on the left, we have the hardware container, which contains all hardware to operate the handheld device, such as the Nexus 5 circuit boards, the batteries, and the Arduino. So both parts include self-designed printed circuit boards, 
which connect the handheld device with the hardware container using a flexible flat cable. The PCBs basically act as an extension adapter to separate the remaining touch sensing components from the hardware. We share the PCB schemes, the 3D models for the frame and container, as well as our source code in the data set on our website. The link is also in the paper. So our devices themselves communicate over a Wi-Fi network, which is operated by the front device. So the back side and the edges send their capacitive measurements to the front side, which merges and provides them to the application layer so that each Android application can use these measurements. And the capacitive measurements are represented by a capacitive image, which is available every 50 milliseconds. So this is an example of such a capacitive image. So this image basically represents low resolution fingerprints and represents the electrical capacitance caused by the touches on the device surface. So for the edges, each copper plate is represented by one pixel in this image. And to access these values on a Nexus 5 device, we modified the Android kernel and pulled the data from the debugging interface. And based on these capacitive images, we will train a deep learning model to estimate the 3D finger position or fingertip positions on the device surface. So to train a model, we conducted a study to collect capacitive images and the respective 3D finger positions. We used a motion capture system to record the position of the fingertips and our device with a sub-millimeter accuracy. And we attach reflective markers on each joint of the hand and the rigid body of four markers on the top side of our device to enable motion tracking. And thereby, we covered a wide range of finger positions by instructing participants how to move their fingers based on three variables. So the participants started by holding the device in one or five common grips, which were presented in previous work by Liadal. We then instructed them to move a specific finger in a given pattern. And the patterns include free movements of the fingers, swiping gestures, or placing their fingers at different locations and holding them there for a short time. Each condition lasts 30 seconds, so that, so that each participant was recorded for about 40 minutes during the study. And in total, we, we recruited 20 participants for our study. So this video clip shows some of the free finger movements that participants performed during the study. So the visualization on the bottom left side shows the resulting capacitive images from the finger movements on the device surface. And here on the right, we can see the captured 3D finger positions as provided by our OptiTrack system. So the axis that you can see in the, ba in the background basically represent the orientation and the position of our device. So after the study, we pre-process our data set to assign the 3D finger positions to each capacitive image. And in the first step, we labeled all recorded markers using the semi-automatic labeling approach as provided by the OptiTrack software. We also removed all incomplete frames, which did not include all markers or the rigid body because of occlusion problems. And in the second step, we then transformed the marker positions to a local coordinate system so that basically each marker represents the 3D distance to the upper left corner of our device. And in the last step, we match the capacitive images to the 3D motion data based on their millisecond timestamps. And in total, we had over 9 million samples, which we stored in an HDF5 file to use it for model training. So we trained a convolutional neural network which estimates the position of the fingertips based on the capacitive images. So for model development and evaluation, we split our data set into three sets, which is common practice for deep learning. And thereby, the training set consists of 14 participants and was used to train our CNN. And in the grid search, we then optimize the hyperparameters of our CNN, such as the number of layers or the number of neurons, to achieve the lowest error on the test set, which consists of four participants. And the validation set consists of two participants and was never touched before in this process. And we used this set once in the end to validate the model which performed the best on our test set. And in terms of optimization, we developed our own loss function to consider the error in the axis, which is perpendicular to the touch screen. 
So basically, because the touchscreen cannot track movements above or below it, we uh, lower the weight of the z-axis on the loss function, since a less accurate estimation can be easily compensated by checking the blob availability in the capacitive image during runtime. And therefore, we use the traditional root mean squared error function for the x and y axis and a root mean squared logarithmic error for the z axis. And our CNN architecture consists of four convolution layers and two fully connected layers with 256 and 128 neurons each. And thereby, as input, we expect a 28 by 32 capacitive image as provided by our device. And the output consists of 15 neurons, which basically represents the X, Y, and Z axis of all five fingers holding the device. So we use the validation set to calculate the mean absolute error of our model. And thereby, the error is defined as the offset between the estimated position of the model and the ground truth position as provided by our abstract system in centimeters. So the average error for the X and Y axis is 0.85 centimeters, while the Z axis error is 0.53 centimeters. So as a comparison, the average diameter of a human index fingertip is 1.6 to 2 centimeters, while previous work also showed that traditional touch interaction has a systematic offset of 0.4 centimeters. And with these errors, our model already enables to perform precise interaction for use cases such as finger-specific gestures or finger placements as action modifiers on the backside. So we deployed the model on our prototype using TensorFlow Mobile on the front unit. And thereby, one inference takes 24.7 milliseconds on average, which enables the model to run in the background and estimate the finger positions for each frame. And we exported our model without any modifications, but techniques such as quantization or pruning could further reduce the runtime for a small loss of accuracy here. So instead of using the model for each frame, we could also assign the estimated finger positions to the closest blob in the capacitive image and then just track the blob. And this would reduce the workload since a model inference is only needed when new blobs are appearing in the capacitive image. So we used OpenCV to detect the block contours and match them with the closest estimation point. And our simple tracking algorithm takes 3.4 milliseconds on average instead of the 24.7 milliseconds for model inference. So we show that the finger positions can be estimated accurately for different use cases. And future work could improve our results by using other touch sensing techniques to get a higher resolution for the touch image. So in contrast to the space-saving capacitive touchscreen, infrared sensing or frustrated total internal reflection would provide images with a higher resolution which could be used for model training. And also unintended activations in our use cases could be minimized by post-processing the estimated positions. So for the finger-specific gestures example, we could use a threshold for a minimum gesture length or the confidence score of gesture recognizers to compensate for wrong estimations. And for the action modifier use case, we could also display the action state on the front screen so that users are aware of what will be done next. And lastly, we separated the touch sensing components from the processing units to keep the handheld device as small as possible. So smartphone manufacturers could, for example, then use proprietary sensors such as a flexible PCB to integrate everything into a small device and therefore avoid the hardware container. So to sum up this talk, we presented InfiniTouch, a smartphone prototype which enables finger wear interaction on the whole device surface. And our contribution consists of a fully touch-sensitive smartphone which runs Android and has the form factor of a standard smartphone. And in addition, we trained a deep learning model which estimates the 3D finger position with a mean absolute error of 0.74 centimeters. We released the PCP schemes, the source code, and our data set on our project website, and future work could use our data set, which by the way contains the marker positions of all 20 joints, to uh, reconstruct even the whole hand posture. And this would enable a wide range of use cases, such as transferring the whole hand into virtual reality or predict actions based on the hand kinematics. 
So thank you for your attention, and I'm open to taking questions now. So we have uh, microphones back there and over there if you have any questions. Um, is that Gregory coming up? Yes, yes it is. Um, interesting talk. As I was listening to it, I'm thinking, uh, this is such a straightforward idea. Why haven't companies pursued this? So I did a little research while you were talking. There's actually a 2016 patent application by Microsoft that does exactly this. I'm wondering what, why you think we don't see this in commercial devices right now, given your experience. Yes, so um, one problem that could be is the usability. So basically, the whole device gets touch sensitive now. And what could happen is users will hold it in their hand and accidentally perform input. And also what is not really investigated now is how do actually fingers move on such a device and how can we increase the reachability to a level which makes it um, suitable for the mass market. So I think it's basically the usability uh, aspect there. Okay, Dan? Hi, Dan Ashbrook, University of Copenhagen. Um, so given that, I'm curious, do you think that there's anything, any usability that you can do without actually identifying all the fingers? Because you've got these fairly specific hand poses you've trained on. It doesn't necessarily work with multiple hands, I assume. Mm -hmm. um, so if we, if we say, okay, we're not going to train on a user's fingers, can we just do something by sensing the capacitive footprint in general? So you mean whether we can interact with it without finger identification, but instead of just using the gestures? Mm -hmm. right. So sure, we can use it for uh, simple shortcuts, for example, so we can uh, train a gesture recognizer to identify gestures independent from which finger identifies, uh, from which finger performed the gesture, and can uh, simply use it for like launching application or accessing the clipboard as I, can show, as I showed in this talk. Yeah. Yeah, hi, uh, Jamin from Seoul National University. A nice talk. Uh, so I think ultimately this model should be integrated with the mobile phone itself, but uh, do you think about the uh, power consumption of running this model? on the mm. mobile devices? Okay, so, in our, so our prototype basically contains of three separate devices. So two Nexus 5 devices and an Arduino, which are all um, operated by different batteries there. So I think if this prototype would be developed by a smartphone manufacturer, everything that would be added is like a flexible PCB or some additional sensor, which would uh, sense the touches on the backside, for example. And thereby it depends on which sensor they use for the battery consumption. So in our, uh, in our uh, case, we have the same battery runtime or a little bit lower than a normal Nexus DI, uh, 5 device would have. 